What is an extra rule your family added to a popular board or card game? My father-in-law keeps note of who has wronged him with a series of annotations beside the score when we play cards. Ah, I see he plays Total War, Warhammer 2. That's a grudging. Plot twist, it's not to get revenge in-game, it's to give him the longest list at the annual Festivus airing of the grievances. In Clue, once the killer has been discovered, and it's one of the pieces in play, the game becomes a chase. The remaining player turns our roles to get out of the mansion through the doors in the hall. The killer tries to catch the remaining pieces and kill them. Secret passages only work if you roll even numbers in that room. The killer rolls twice per turn and cannot use secret passages. Edit, if the killer wasn't one of the played pieces, then the game is over, they couldn't defend themselves and surrendered after being discovered. The killer kills other players by landing on the same space as them between rooms, or by rolling a higher number than them in the same room. If there are two players in a room with the killer, killer must announce who they're going after. After one attack, killer's turn is over. Players must escape by leaving the hall through the doors. Entering the hall is one move. Leaving the hall is another. You should try to have at least one more move upon entering the hall to get out safely. If rolling a 3 would get you into the hall, a 4 plus, would get you out. If no players make it out alive, the killer wins, stacks the bodies in the cellar, locks it, and pretends that none of this has ever happened. Extra fun, at the start of the game, before dealing to players, place an evidence card face down in each room. When you enter the room, you can look at the card and place it back face down. You're sleuthing, after all. If all players have seen the card, you may turn it face up. Edit, it was the stranger, in the thread, with the silver. Thank you. In Scrabble, the person who can make the longest word goes first, highest points breaks a tie. This makes the game more fun by ensuring there are lots of places to play your letters. That's the best rule here. To be honest. We used to play with 10 tiles. Makes the words more interesting. Our house variant is 9 tiles with the bonus structure set at 50 for 7 letters, 60 for 8, 75 for 9. My father custom built a 9 tile Scrabble board where all the bonus squares are spaced out differently. It's amazing. Just started playing Corkle and that's how you decide who starts and it makes so much sense to use it for Scrabble too. Dear Lord, Corkle gets vicious in our house. In Monopoly we have a rule that my sister can't be the banker otherwise it's like watching Ocean's Eleven. My sister growing up seemed to win every time she was banker. We had one of the electronic banks die Monopoly too so it was easier to cheat. She can't shake the name Crooked Banker for any game we play, including games that have no bank aspect to them. If a role in Parcheesi is suspect, it's because she's the Crooked Banker. I don't even think she's ever cheated on purpose it's just really fun to make fun of her. My brother is the Crooked Banker of the family, he nicks $100 here, $100 there, extra $20 in the change, that kind of subtle crap. Meanwhile, I'd probably be best described as the heister of the family. My defining moment being the time I managed to nick about $3,000 from the bank when no one was looking. Right under my cousin's nose. My older cousin kept his savings under the board. Naive as I was I listened to him when he was explaining what a great idea it was. He was stealing my savings for years when he would collect his and I was none the wiser. God I was dumb but lesson slowly learned. As a rule, I embezzle when I'm the banker. Shh. My uncle told me stories about how whenever he played Monopoly at a friend's house he would always bring a few $500 bills from his own set and use them. I really like running Monopoly with two 20-sided dice instead of the default six-sided, makes it a lot more chaotic. Ooh. This is a great idea. I've got to imagine that it would shake up the meta of Monopoly. Like the orange and red spaces would no longer be the best sets of properties to buy. I'd recommend 2d8, 1d6 plus 1d8, or even 3d4 instead. 2d20 is way too big a spread to think about hotspots on the board. 2d20. There are 40 squares on the Monopoly board, so 2d20 means you can reach any square on the board from your current position. 
My issue with it is you'd have to tone down the pass go, collect 200. Average of 2d6 equals 7, average of 2d20 equals 21 dot so you should collect 60 or 75 bucks when passing go to average it out. The goal would be to largely remove hot spots on the board. You still have slightly higher variance around 21 positions from jail, so yellow and green should become number 1 and number 2 sets to try to get. Normally you have a 1 6th chance of getting an extra turn, roll a double, and a 1 216th going to jail on your turn, 3 doubles in a row, to keep roughly those odds with d20, you can make it so that rolls within one of each other count as a double. I just call it $50 for passing go, it's easier and 1 quarter of $200 is not much different from 1 third like you were aiming for. Oh my god that's such a good idea. Literally anything goes in Monopoly. Whatever business deals you make in Monopoly are valid for example paying some insurance each round so that if you land on their rent properties you are immune. When I was a kid, the small group of friends I had all played crazy, days long games of Monopoly through summer and especially winter breaks. As far as anything goes, we took it even away from the game. Crap like, sell me St. Charles Place for $2,500, and you don't have to ever pay for landing on it, and also I'll wash the dishes and take out the trash for you tonight. Or, give me immunity on your yellow monopoly and I won't attack your army with any land units in our next StarCraft game. Buildings only. Or even, we each have two railroads, let's form a cartel. Give me your two, and we'll split all rail income 50-50. To keep me honest, I'll give you control of my purple monopoly. You'll hold those deeds but I still get 100% of the profits. If I ever don't share the rail profits, you keep the purples. If you ever don't give me the purple profits, I keep your two rails. This bargaining extended to times we were totally away from the game too. Crap like, oh there's only one pizza bagel left. I'll give you $500 of Monopoly cash for it. We did all of this as well, but we also added bailout, where basically you could borrow unlimited funds from the bank as long as you agree to a payback and interest schedule. We were too young to realize, at first anyway, that this made the game never ending. The True Game of Life This sounds like you might have taught yourselves about what happened in 2008 inadvertently. Wait the rail cartel is actually genius. We had a game spiral so deeply into cross-player alliances and deals that every move took about 5 minutes to work out who owed what to whom, and half the time it all cancelled out. We had 7 year olds writing 4 party contracts across multiple amortization periods. We opted to skip that rule moving forward. It's all fun and games until you have to hire an attorney every time you land on a property with hotels. I'd like to file for Chapter 11 Mr. Banker. The trick is to restructure your assets under several shell corporations before filing for bankruptcy, so you get the benefits of absolving your debts without actually liquidating your assets. We would do deals where if you traded properties W me to help me complete a set you were immune for the first X number of times you landed on them the insurance idea is fantastic though. Onk. My grandmother was deaf slash mute so when we played Uno instead of saying Uno we knocked on the table quickly twice. When my mother-in-law was suffering from dementia we would play Uno with her and just let her play any card she wanted to play. She was at a point where she couldn't follow the rules of the game but she did understand that she should put down a card when it was her turn. So we just let her play whatever she wanted. It introduced a fun chaotic element to the game and she got to enjoy participating and spending time with us. That is wonderful, how wholesome. I was a nurse's aide who worked with Alzheimer's and dementia patients and they were some of the most interesting and fun people I ever met. It's a bittersweet feeling because they are in their own world, unfettered in a way. My favorite grandma had dementia, and while it broke my heart to watch her disappear, she was the sweetest goofiest most mischievous little girl by the end and I wouldn't trade those memories for the world. Her nursing home had a, stuffed animal, petting zoo one day, and my formerly buttoned up granny hoisted her dress up quite high, made herself a big carrying pouch out of the skirt, and promptly stole each and every one of those animals. And then hid them in her roommate's dresser so she wouldn't get busted for it. This from a woman who spent a lifetime folding laundry at the dining room table because the carpet wasn't clean enough. Uno was the one game three quarters of the clients I worked with at a group home could and would play, 
the other client had a wicked rage and zero attention span to play turn-taking games, including the client who struggled to play other games. She received some basic instruction each turn to remind her she could only put down cards of the same number and color, but she could play pretty well. She also could only say certain words, so for her saying Uno was holding up the U sign language letter and saying oh wow. It was really nice to play with her since she didn't play any other games and usually just watch movies. It was also a really helpful way to help her form a more positive relationship with a housemate she would pinch and beat up. There is a game called Twos which is basically Uno with a regular deck of playing cards that we would play before we ever had an actual Uno deck in our rule and that has always been to knock on the table when you have one card left. Taboo, you can play 3 player, cutthroat, taboo. The rules don't really change but the scoring does. There's a ref, watching for taboo words, guesser, can't see the card, and talker, can see the card, the guesser and talker will get 1 point each for each successful guessed word. Taboo words are scored 1 point to the ref. At the end of the round, rolls rotate like normal, clockwise. After everyone has 2 turns talking, rotate the other way, counterclockwise. This lets everyone get a turn guessing and talking with each person. I prefer this way because you don't get stuck on a winning, or losing team. Everyone plays with everyone. And there's never a fourth person out. That's a good one. Don't know if I'll bring Taboo back into the household though. Me and the wife got into one of our biggest fights over Taboo. It was back when we were dating, and we don't remember what really caused it. We just know it was Taboo and have agreed we will never play it again. If only there was a word for that kind of forbidden activity. Late to the party here but in Monopoly we allow the utilities to collect 5% of any player to player transaction over $200. It helps keep the utilities relevant and desirable. You've got me thinking, but shouldn't utilities scale with the number of properties owned? Or maybe per building built? Seriously, those utilities in all those buildings has got to start adding up. I like this idea. Scaling up, like as a percentage of the rent of each developed property. 5% of a hotel on boardwalk is still a lot. That's very interesting. I have often noticed the utilities feeling like a drag. So this could be fun. I don't think they're necessarily a drag. They're cheap to purchase and if you get the pair, they repay themselves pretty quickly, they offer a safe haven in some pretty tricky parts of the board and there's chance slash community chess cards that direct players to those spaces. Not terrible, but certainly not going to win you the game. If you're going to get 5% of any transaction over $200, they need to go up in price. In Trivial Pursuit, we have a rule, if the player being asked doesn't know the answer, they can ask the room. The room doesn't actually answer, but they say whether they know the answer or not. If nobody knows the answer, it's considered an invalid question, and another card gets drawn instead. If someone in the room does know, but the player being asked doesn't, then it's just a plain old pass, my dad knows a lot of stuff, I mean, a lot. When he was a kid he read the Encyclopedia Britannica for fun. Basically, the rule was born from, if even dad doesn't know the answer, then nobody does and it's a terrible question. I like this rule. My family has done similar before with other trivia games but on an irregular basis. I might propose this become a thing at the next board game night. Maybe bring it up at the next board meeting? You are fired. Do you think this is a game? This would have been a good rule the one time I played Trivial Pursuit and my girlfriend and I used an old copy my parents had. The question was something like which country drinks the most beer per person? My girlfriend first guessed Germany which was wrong only because the answer was West Germany. We had a trivial pursuit kicking around in college from 1980-something and no one could get a single answer except my stepdad, who is 70. We were crying laughing while he yelled at us how do you not know who Telly Savalas is? Edit, thanks guys I am now extremely familiar with his oeuvre after my stepdad went apoplectic about this 10 years ago. Glad to see so many Telly heads though. That really should count. Germany and West Germany are the same thing. The card says moops. At the end of Scrabble you make up a story with all the words on the board. We never looked at the tiles for scores, we just played to get the best words on the board. Wow, that sounds lovely actually, 
good to spark creativity as well. We did something similar with Cards Against Humanity. Pick up a card, start the story, go around the table. Got some really weird stories. In Uno we draw cards until we can throw one down. No limits. We have had to buy a second deck because of this. We also possibly lost friendships over it too. My brothers and I play like this. I won a game and they kept going for second third and fourth place, and nobody got second for 45 minutes. It was agonizing seeing them keep going, and going, and going. You might be interested in Uno Flip. It has the normal colors on one side of the cards and a dark side with harsher rules. One of the dark side cards has a rule where you do exactly as you described above. Uno Flip is so much effing fun. It's also really, really hard to keep track of cards that are boring on one side and overpowered on the other side. You have to play the overpowered cards ASAP, before someone else flips the deck and you lose it in the ensuing madness. Wait that's not a rule? It is not. Consider my surprise when I actually read the rules for the first time. Current rules don't say to do that, though we played like that too, seems to be a common variant. Funny we were pretty strict rule-wise on Uno, we even played for points which hardly anyone does. I used to play like that too, I just shuffled the pile of played cards back into the deck after no cards could be drawn. Another fun ruling is that playing a zero passes everyone's hand to the game direction, left or right, and playing a 7 you swap your hand with someone else. But don't play a 0 or 7 as your last card because you pass your win to someone else. That's the rules in UNO Online. It makes the game so much more fun. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to be the first to know about Red Rabbit Reader's new videos. If you like our videos, please like them on YouTube and share them with your friends. We welcome your comments below. Press to start another of our videos.